Hello. Hello, hello. Um, I'm Aleri, curator at October Gallery. It's my real pleasure to welcome you all to here today um, for Goldman's Fathi's exhibition, No Rain Will Put Out This Fire. Um, so the great Golnaz will be in conversation with Dr. Suzanne uh, Babwe, um, Professor of Islamic and Iranian Arts at the Courtauld Institute of Arts. Um, so without further ado, I will pass over to these two incredible women. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the baton is handed to me, <laughs> as it were. Um, so I'm Susan Babai. It's a delight to have so many people here, and especially to be in conversation with uh, one of the great artists of contemporary Iran, Golnaz Fathi, uh, whose work surrounds us in these galleries and, and beautifully really generate thoughts and conversations. And they never ending, actually, uh, on that front. So uh, the format of this is a conversation, really. Uh, the idea is to uh, bring the artist to speak about things that she would not, uh, or we would not necessarily access by looking at her work in so many ways. Not that she needs to tell us any further. We can do our own job, and it's our job to figure out what are these works about, and you do uh, your own reading and interpretation of everything. However, as a historian, I'm interested in, in knowing and recording what the artist is doing, has done, and will do, as it were. Uh, so I um, am going to start by posing questions to and, and really engage Golnaz into a conversation uh, and maybe even slightly more, I mean, conversation is always about a give and a take, but this is more I take she has to give. Uh, but then we will move on to opening the, uh, the conversation to the audience for your questions. Um, someone has to tell me when to stop. Uh, because I know we can have a very long uh, chat if we want to. Um, I'd like to, one, uh, perhaps thank Golnaz for having agreed to sit down to this, uh, to this uh, bit of conversation and pose to her, starting with something which, uh, in fact, one of my PhD students posed who couldn't come today, but was very curious about the work of Golnaz and, and the kinds of things that we engage in conversation in our own sort of classroom, if you will, seminar discussions, looking at art, closely looking at art. And that is um, about legibility. So Golnaz does a lot of work which evokes writing. And I say evokes. So I'd like to ask her, and this is a po question posed, uh, about that question of your, um, your use of the element of writing, essentially, um, which um, is not legible. I mean, I can read letters. If you're a Persian or Arabic speaker and, and literate, you can read the letters. Uh, but once you put them together, they're not meant to make any particular sense. So in that regard, they are not legible. Uh, I also don't feel that they are pseudo-Persian or, um, or that they are pretending to be, but they are not. In European paintings of the medieval period, a great many artists, for instance, would paint pseudo-Arabic text around the robe of the Virgin as a way of situating the historical uh, sort of uh, location of the birth of Jesus Christ and so forth by introducing pseudo-Arabic. But these are not pseudo-linguistic interventions. So the question is, is this a form of resistance to legibility? 
given, oh my goodness, this is not meant to be the moment of stopping, rather starting. Uh, is it a, a form of resistance to your own learning, your own classical training in calligraphy? Or is there some sense of a continuation in there? Um, can you dis discuss a little bit your relationship with, perhaps, with writing? Yeah. I studied calligraphy in the highest level. But uh, when I had my first exhibition at the age of 24, my first solo exhibition in Tehran, uh, I used writings. And uh, it wasn't easy to read. So I saw people coming, going near to the work. And then they asked me, have you written anything? And at that time, I had written a poem of Hafez. When I told them that poem, they were deeply touched. That was not a good point for me, because uh, I found out that, especially in Iranian culture, how poetry is important, how literature is important. And that was a painting for me. And the power of words were stronger than my work for them. Um, good experience that since then, for <laughs> the past 22 years, I've been working on my own alphabets to make them purely form because I don't want, this is my personal style, I'm not giving any message through my writings. Uh, I usually work with music, so I say I'm the choreographer and the alphabets are my dancers. Through the rhythm of the music, I move them the way I want to and I'll also um, the heart discipline that I learned through years for the <coughs> traditional calligraphy, and now the whole freedom I give to myself, physical movements, completely the opposite of, of a thing that doesn't exist in traditional calligraphy. It's some kind of a meditation work that you learn how even to control your breath, because if you breathe while you're writing, your hand would shake. And I'm grateful to all of those years, actually. Uh, uh, there's an expression that says you have to master the rules in order to be able to break them. So I wanted to invent a language that everybody could read. No separation that I'm Iranian, you're American, you're British. Uh, I wanted to transform it like a poet, that I don't believe a poem needs translation because everybody can translate it depending what they want to. So I wanted to have writings that everybody who's standing in front of it without separation of any nationality. We are all human beings. and. Uh, I ask people not to read my writings with their eyes, but with their heart, uh, and translate it. It's some kind of an interaction that you, as a viewer, take responsibility or take action and uh, interpret as whatever as you want to. And opposite of the thing that people at the openings expect from the artists that they ask questions from me. I say, I've been doing these words in my studio. I've said whatever I wanted, but obviously in a very abstract language. But I'm here to hear your words. And uh, the people who have, during years, told me their interpretation from my work had fascinated me so much, because it opened with my, my mind that uh, I never thought of that. And how beautiful it is to, to see it in that point of view. So this shows that it could be translated in millions of ways with different cultures in different nations. And I think that makes art interesting. Mm -hmm. that it has no borders. I wanted to break the borders for, you know, I, I don't even want to say Persian calligraphy, whatever. I don't know where this comes. Yes, I have studied Persian calligraphy, but it, it's no longer calligraphy. It's my unwritten, it's my, um, it might be my secrets that somebody could translate even for myself. <laughs> so 
believe me, it, it's, it's sometimes it's my anger, it's sometimes the things I couldn't say, uh, it's sometimes my scream, I couldn't, I didn't dare to have it, um, my happiness, whatever. It's, it's, it's my life hidden in those writings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think there is a lot in there to, to sort of unpack, if you will. But I want to focus on two things. One is you point out something really important, which is this is not about calligraphy. And um, I think the m misunderstanding that comes from the separation of fields uh, where calligraphy is a, is a particular category and uh, painting is another category. These are um, the, the sort of traps of, of old forms of archiving the art and artists. But one thing you point out, which I think is really important, is um, a critique of logocentrism. Uh, the fact that so many of us somehow, and this is true especially in those, uh, in those cultural worlds where poetry, for instance, has been hugely important, that we are incredibly tied up with the word, so to speak. And, and certainly Persian culture is all about poetry and it has enormous commitment to the poetic. And, uh, and the fact that you break away from it or you reinvent it, as it were, uh, inviting everyone to make up whatever poetic thoughts they want to make up for is a, it's not quite anti-logocentrism, but also really engaging with the critique of logocentrism in many ways. It, it feels to me, at least, what you're saying is Can I related. Add something? Of I, course. It's very interesting, this part that you're mentioning, because um, usually the calligraphers, they know thousands of poems by heart, because you are always writing a poem. For me, it's the opposite. Since right. beginning, I was fascinated by the forms, ups and downs, and the beauty of, of each alphabet, which even today, if I stand in front of a Japanese-Chinese calligraphy, the last thing is to understand, I mean, to ask someone what has it, what's written. I, I'm looking at it with always with uh, pictorial eyes. Right. And the same thing happened for me, for, for Farsi. I rarely know any poem by heart, which for eight years I, I practiced eight hours a day writing them. But if somebody, even while I was writing, was asking, what are you writing? I had to say, okay, let me see. And then that, that's really strange. This is what I always have been thinking, what is it? Um, but it takes me away writing Calligraphy, it's my meditation. I don't know how to sit and meditate, but my meditation was those writings. Yeah. It took me to another world. Yeah. No, I think this is really important. The fact that the, visu the visuality side of it is, it's not to say visuality takes over the, the word, but it's to say that that is equally important part of thinking within a cultural world that tends to privilege the word over the picture. And, and this may very well be um, a historical misunderstanding of what is Persian culture about. Is it about the poetic or is it about the look of the writing, what it looks like essentially. But aside from that, the other thing you said which really triggered my thinking was what you call traditional. What do you mean traditional? This is a really important issue. We always quite unthinkingly say this is based on traditions of Persian art or calligraphy. But what is tradition? When we look at the work of a European artist or an American artist, hardly ever the word tradition comes up. What is it that we have to do this to establish the work of people from Asia, Africa, against a tradition? Is it because we don't understand them? Or is it because you actually refer back to something which an American or a, or a French wouldn't? 
speculating on that one. What do you think? <laughs> difficult question. <laughs> That's very difficult. Um, I'm not knowledgeable as you. I think <laughs> y you're the one who should describe this. But I have to say traditional calligraphy because what is anything behind? I mean, we only have that. And when I want to talk about that, I have to say, OK, I have studied traditional calligraphy, but today no longer. I'm not doing that. But uh, somehow it might be something that we have been living with it through years. But then it's a day you want to break all the ropes and to say, I'm cut out mm. of these paths. So tradition means older. Something, something like that maybe. Something, something for us all to think about, actually. It's ve I, that's why I say it's very yeah. complicated question that someone knowledgeable like you can, can no, not I, I illiterate, it is me. I yeah, I'm, I'm pondering, I'm pondering with you and I'd like to hear your thinking about it as, as a but really... But I do agree with you, that re this refers more for Middle East than, we never hear, hear something like that for Americans, for Europeans, we don't hear that. No, but we hear it when an African artist does something, is it within the traditions of Africa? Is it within the traditions of Morocco? Is it within the traditions of India? And if it is, then it is authentic. If it is not, then it is whatever. It's made in some other non-authentic context. Uh, at least for calligraphy, can I say that? Because it doesn't exist the way it exists in Middle East and Far East. It doesn't exist in America or Europe. Correct. So, uh, but when we say calligraphy, it exists these days. Right. That's the, the word that we have to use, that the tradition, cali the traditional calligra calligraphy that we have, it never existed in America. So w what, what word should it's we use? It's the tradition that is my concern. OK. <laughs> so I'm putting it out there for everyone to think through this discussion. Maybe we can re revisit it, right? Yeah. Classical, it's a very maybe, important thing you're you know, asking. But who's, who's to say my handwriting is not classical, right? But, but again, or your handwriting. Is, is, uh, isn't classical different from tradition? Again, I think that's Yeah, well, different. that's the point. The classical is that which we revere. It's a, it's a great moment. That because uh, right now you refer to classical. We have classic music. But in Iran, we have traditional music. Again, that doesn't exist in Europe, you know? It's like there are classical or, or traditional music in Europe, too. Yeah. The Bayou music, for instance, is probably traditional. I don't know. But, but it's, it's, a, it's a really loaded word. That's what I'm, I'm yeah. trying for us to think about as we look at your work and as we think about it. It's loaded. So think about it. Sure. Maybe at sure. the end of this conversation, we come Back circle around and think about what, what is it that we are saying, right? Is it something that we borrow something She's not going to let it go, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know that. Maybe tradition is something you borrow from the past. Maybe. It's, a, it's not a bad, bad thinking, yeah. But, but something to think about, right? All right. Um, can I change this to... Uh, there is a Persian word, actually, uh, Golnaz taught me, ang, <laughs> which relates to this. Can you speak about that? Ang is a word that <laughs> you can be, it's like an accusation. Accus accusation. Accusation. It's not a positive word, actually. It's, uh, it's a thing that you can say about the work. You can say about an act. You, you accused me of stealing something. So in Farsi we say you, you put this ang on me. <laughs> that so the ang on you is me. that this, is, this has to be Persian calligraphy. It's this you're is accused ang. Yes, of. this yeah. can be ang. Yes. Yeah, OK. Yes. All right. OK, that, that far we can go. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you about a few other things. One of which is, if everyone on your way out look at the catalogs on the, on the table, 
these are catalogues, am I right? Catalogues of the previous exhibitions and this exhibition. And it's interesting to sort of think about Golnaz's um, development of, of she, she's recognizable. This is the work I recognize. If you go to the British Museum, I don't know if it is on view right now. Yeah. It's okay. not, no. not, not, I didn't see it recently, but they, they have some of those earlier works which are these scrolls that hang from ceiling to the floor and have a very different uh, feel. They are much more um, physically in your space, actually. Uh, the second group, which were books, like books, right? Uh, which when I... I, I had the privilege of opening that exhibition for Golnaz some years ago, and I remember thinking the way she would do this is like, like a, like, spewing it out, like puffing it out, you know, like spraying it out. And now finally, you're actually using spray in a way that is, uh, that is different, and and technology is different. Technology of the making crafting of your work has changed. And I wondered if you can talk about that. This brings us to think in terms of the materials or materiality, if we want to be fancy, or think in terms of scale, but also think in terms of the ways in which your performance has changed. I, I mean, those were very different kinds of works, in fact. Can you speak a little bit about what has happened? Yeah, uh, you, you talked about my previous exhibition. That was more meditative. That was borrowed from that siomash technique that you sit for hours and lines on top of each other. You Can I explain siomash? Yes, please. So it is in, in, um, in learning to master calligraphy, you repeat the same letter again and again and again and, and on top of each other so that you really master letter by letter, form by form. And each calligrapher does that before writing the final text. It's some kind of even warming up your hand to get ready to, to write the final text. So in my previous show, I used that technique, but with my own lines, the writings. I mean, not writings, but even the thing I do, they have become that much abstract that they were nearly like a line. So I put lines on top of each other, layers of lines that I wish to black, then to light gray. But if you ask me what inspires you, I would say the daily life. Life has changed. Mm. The past year, few months, whatever. I mean, the life we have been experiencing in Iran was something that <laughs> I, I couldn't do any meditative works. There was so much. I cannot find even the right word that uh, uh, the compulsion mm -hmm. that I had. Compulsion. To the compulsion yeah. or the urge to go to studio and transform my feeling at that very moment. Mm. I remember I read uh, read something about Keith Haring. He was saying that uh, a true art is to transform your soul into your peace mm. and let people to go further than that. Every day I went to my studio and I worked. And the way from my home to, to the studio that I go, and I see all the walls covered with slogans. Again, the other day, there are others spraying the, the slogans. Again. On, so it's somehow a kind of a siamash on the walls of my city. <laughs> and, uh, and spray painted. Spray, yes. I mean, people write these mm. slogans with spray. <coughs> I see them with pictorial eyes again. They, they had been my inspiration every day. Every part of the city that you go, you can see it. <coughs> so spray came to my works because um, sometimes my brush mm. couldn't translate the exact feeling. So I had the urge of using 
spray. Yeah. And these physical movement, uh, moving the, the, the canvas in different directions, you can see sometimes a drop of colors, whatever. So it's, it's combined with physical movement. I work on the floor, so mm. um, um, it's compared to like an action painting. Uh, mm. It's some way that I can empty myself. Mm. Is this the right word? Yeah. And there's something about what you say which I, I want to come back to that. The, the very um, the physical uh, engagement, the way you both see and act on what surrounds you. Especially, I'm really curious about these flat lines. It looks like flat liners mm -hmm. run through so many of them. Do you know what is a flat line? When someone dies, your heartbeat goes flat okay. on the screen. So there is a flat line in many of these, and it's really almost shocking. It, sto it stops me. Mm -hmm. I, you know, when I look at the paintings, I, I sort of zero in on those mm -hmm. flat lines oftentimes. I've been looking at the paintings for quite a while only in two days' time, but I'm really <coughs> taken by that. And I'd like to, to ask you, what is that? Is that your final sort of, and now it is done? Is this when you say, bas? Exactly, because those <laughs> flat lines are the last step in the work. Yep. It's the last, and th then I'll do the signature. That's really quite powerful to think about the the final statement on the canvas, and at that point, it's done. It's exactly. Ex You're that's done. That's the right. I'm done. Okay. Yeah. So I, I somebody asked me, how long does it take to do them? And I was talking about these very, um, not lot, but small flat line. I said, I do the painting, but it maybe takes two days that I go to the studio, I stand in front of it, and I don't know. I know it's unfinished. And it needs that red. I don't know where to put it. If I put it in the wrong way, I have destroyed the whole painting. So it's two minutes to put that with a spray. But where to put it, it's annoying sometimes. So yeah. days I might go to the studio looking at it and don't find it. But then there's a time, one second, you take the spray and So finish. I encourage you afterwards, go look at the works again. If you haven't noticed the powerful bold presence of that flat line. It's, a, it's really that boldness is something that I think you're, you're talking about, the boldness of being alive, the boldness of every day going to the studio, the boldness of, of painting. I mean, you don't have a huge, a huge following in Iran, do you? Uh, to be honest, you are, you are, by the way, let yeah. me preface that one. I'm sorry. Someone told me she's the most prominent artist in Iran, living in Iran. Comes from outside, while you talk about being. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. It's, I just wanted to say, let me preface that. My point was, as we had con talked about this okay. one, you talk about being feeling alone or yeah, lonely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to get you to talk about that. Because from outside yeah. of your own sort of home to studio back home. Because studio, my attorney You are said known, actually. <laughs> Thank you for those who In said Iran, that. In Iran, I meant. Not, yeah. you know, the outside world is, is another matter. Uh, my studio is a very, very private place for me. I rarely let anybody to come. Even my partner, <laughs> twice a year he's allowed to come. And it's when he is insisting very much. Otherwise, he has to wait for me downstairs that I go. None of my friends have come to my uh, studio, except the photographer to take photos from images. I am completely uh, had lost this the attitude that it's normal people come and visit your studio. But this is my manner. I, I know there are so many artists that they love to have gatherings, talkings, mm. I mean, sharing ideas in their studios. 
and volunteer to say, okay, come home. So from, mm. from studio, immediately I go home and ha uh, in, I mean, have gatherings at home, never at studio. So it's my isolation there. And at the same time, it's my heaven that I have built up. But it, it's a mess. It's a very, very messy place, but it belongs only to me. And once I remember I was in Paris and in a library, I was reading a book about Agnes Martin, which I love her work. Mm -hmm. And she was describing her emotions about her studio. And uh, she was saying the same thing, that no phone calls, mm -hmm. nobody's allowed to come in unless there's fire. <laughs> The air would be poisoned, even if she has used that, if somebody comes. So I was thinking, oh my God, I'm just like her, because I was <laughs> always thinking there's something wrong with me, but, but I love this isolation. I, it, it's my solitude that I can create mm. and work, and, and when I'm not working, I don't stay there. Mm. It, uh, for example, reading, I, I love reading literature, rom uh, fictions. I'm very, very much addicted to that, but there's no one single book in my studio, in atelier. Atelier is somewhere to work, practically. So when it's finished, two minutes I don't stay there, I'll go back home, you know? Mm. And then library is over there. So there are separations for the things I do. Quietly I'm working mm. in my studio and don't exhibit anymore, although I'm proud to say I live there, I mm. love there. It has been my choice to be there. My inspiration is there. I mean, everything. Yeah, and, and that, is, that is really interesting to my mind, to be, you know, on the one hand you speak about it, my inspiration is there. My roots are deeply there, and, yeah. and it has never ever happened that the plane lands in Tehran and I say, oh, we have tons of problems there. <laughs> I mean. Every step, everything you want to do, you have to pass through so many troubles, but I don't see the troubles. And the love is that much powerful that still, I, I, it's the pleasure for me to live yeah. there. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's home. It's home. It's your spiritual home. This is very, like tradition, yeah. the word home is important. Yeah. But I separate them. We will go back to tradition. Yeah, no, just as an importance of the word, home touches my heart deeply. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna use and abuse this audience and you to figure out what is tradition. <laughs> Tonight, that's the goal. <laughs> but home is really important in this regard. So, what does it mean then to be showing here in London, for instance? First, I have to. What is? What? Let me let me re let me add to that, if I may, because I'm gonna let you go. Okay. Um, you know, this is a very different audience, and people say different things to you, and you see people walk into, your, into the gallery, right? Can you speak a little bit about what this means on a more day-to-day -day basis? Because you have been in residence for a while but now. But first of all, I, that's a good question, because I want to say about my feeling about October Gallery. Okay. October Gallery is like home for me. It's like family for me. I'm very, very much fortunate I'm working with them for the past, I don't know, 10, 12 years. They are special people, really. I learn every time when mm -hmm. I am with them. It's, it's not working. I mean, I cannot find the word, but this is something very, very precious for me that uh, I have, all of my friends know uh, October Gallery in Tehran because I explain what happens every time I come here, what mm. an interesting people are here. And, and, and I learn humanity from them. I learn so many things which is valuable for me. And uh, then it's London when you tell me London is a cosmopolitan place that, again, it's a fantastic occasion for me to meet different people from different parts of the world, to make this cultural bridge that, again, no matter mm. what language you speak, no matter where are you from, but 
we all speak one language, no matter if we understand it. It's, it's a place for anybody who loves art to gather here. But for example, yesterday I met, I came to the gallery, except the opening night, mm -hmm. but you say what, what's, what, what, what is important for me. I came out, I was going to my room, because here it has a residency, I stay here at the gallery. Um, then I saw someone had a chair sitting in front of this work. Nice, I, I stood there and nobody was here, it was morning. I stood there looking at him that how much time he is spending because he had chosen a chair <laughs> to sit in front of that work. 20 minutes later, I came down to go to the other way and I saw he had taken chair to the other painting. Again, 20 minutes later, I saw in front of each work he's standing and uh, he had a notebook taking, I mean, writing sketches and then with his hand, he was following the gestures of my hand and I went and I said, hello. And he was disturbed, you know, he was a, a bit angry that, oh, I was in my own world. But I said, I'm sorry, I'm the artist. And all of a sudden he was, he wanted to faint. And <laughs> he said, I couldn't believe, oh, I just came from another city to come and visit this show. And I said, I watched you and you made my day. A person like you, if you can connect with my work that much, I mean, I, I thank you because as, you, as mm. I said before, I'm sitting alone in my studio working. I don't know what I'm doing, good, bad. People would like it. I know nothing. So exhibition and these encounters, these dialects can help me to communicate and hear yeah. people. And that's my award. I go back with lots of energy to continue to work because I know people hurt me. This is important. Nietzsche, the philosopher says, if an, art, if an artwork is not understood, then it's lost. So I think a piece of art, it's an interaction of me and you, both of us, the critic. The critic who understands what is art and then write about it and mm. it makes it to bloom. Mm. So all of these, I mean, what's the use if the artist keeps the works at her home? Mm. But it's for others. So uh, uh, things like yesterday, that guy was my gift, yeah. Yeah, because you otherwise do not have anyone to really, you don't allow them even in your studio. No. <laughs> so even if anyone has an opinion about the new work, they're out of luck. And, and I wonder what, what that means actually, the fact that we are privileged to see your work and think about it and it's, you know, it's mine to do whatever I want with it, right? Yes. Think about it interpret it, put a title on it if I want to, but, um, but no one at home, so to speak, has that privilege. Not even your partner. No, but as soon as the work is out of the gallery, uh, out of my studio, I roll them and it's ready to, to be shipped. Then I'm the foreigner. I'm the stranger, actually. Right. That work is no longer mine. It's right. everybody's. So I lose connection with it yeah. and it's all yours. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's ours. Now it's in our world yeah. and yeah. we have the right to do whatever we want with it. Yeah. Right? Hopefully good things, but nonetheless, you could, for instance, say I have a couch that this fits nicely on top of it. That's also legitimate, depending on who you are and how you think about it. But certainly thinking and, and generating new thoughts as your work does, is this is a way of thinking. I, I look at painting actually, or works, works of art in general. The process of crafting it is a process of thinking and it allows me to engage with that way of thinking. Yeah. And I assume that's what you mean by how you feel that it is a thought is done when you're done Absolutely. with it. And now it can go and create more space. Absolutely. So in some ways, coming to London and to the October Gallery, I want to say a word about October Gallery afterwards. Not that we want to make you feel bad or embarrassed or anything, the October Gallery people, but 
But that, that's the nurturing, in other words. What you're thinking of is how much nurturing you get from coming here. And it's chance encounters with someone like the man who was here yesterday. But also, maybe in this audience, there are people who will really um, get you to think new thoughts. Um, but, but it is an interesting point you make, which is the way in which the artist and, I mean, you are one of us, part of the, the, uh, the family of human beings in the end. But your creative output requires some, some place for it to land, to be received, to be sort of nurtured. And this is what you get here. And I, just a word on, on the very, um, I just today, I was here earlier, and I told uh, the wonderful people here that this is a happy place for me as well, not just for you who are, a, you know, come in residency is long-term relationship. This is representation of your work, of you. Um, for even me who come here on occasion, and I feel like this is indeed a place of nurturance and, and rich sort of encounters. Thank you for the word, nurturing. Yeah. That's the right word. Yeah, and, and this is, this, in other words, is a place you learn as well. Am I right in this? Exactly. Bringing opportunities. I mean, they make occasions for me to meet interesting people. Volunteer to help me in my path. You know, I, I, please don't think because you are here, I'm praising you. This is what I truly, it's unexceptional. October Gallery is something special. I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm truly yeah. fortunate. And, in, in, you know, they do this with their heart. Oh. Their life is mixed with culture. and it, it, They think it's their mission to do this. They're born to do this. So I want to put this in a historical context, if I may. Um, the church used to support artists and artists' work, or the, the court would do so, or some wealthy um, citizens would do so. Um, the kinds of patronage that um, have become the mainstay of contemporary practitioners of arts is a very different thing, and it's, it's really it becomes a family, yeah. and that's how y where you are. And we have actually more than one of those patrons in this room at the very moment. I look at some, Rose Issa, I look at some who are collect the collecting practices are a form of patronage where they actually nurture people whose creativity needs uh, a home, essentially and encouragement. This is not about only people who are stuck in Iran and we take mercy on them. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. The point is that this kind of um, capacity for, uh, for pr production, re-energizing for production of creative work requires some kind of a support. And in a place like Iran, we do not have the mechanisms for it. There used to be, but it doesn't exist anymore. There is no place to gather people into conversation with the artist, or at least you, you are not comfortable being part of it. Um, to have debates, to think about, um, you know, uh, critique of the work, that sort of activity is not there. Or, God forbid, to be supported actually, to live your life by way of a foundation supporting you to, to live and work, produce things. So in so many ways, a gathering like this, I mean, all of you are engaged in this kind of patronage. This is really crucial. This is crucial. I mean, this is for all the Iranian artists in any field that they work. I say we're like orphans. <laughs> Nobody's behind us. I mean, we're not familiar with what is uh, scholarship, 
what is sponsorship, these kind of things. I mean, I, I hope, I mean, we're going to learn, but I don't know where, when. But oh, we uh, know it. It just requires it's a, gonna start, a yes. change of attitude. You know, <laughs> Iranians get emotional. So yeah. it has been periods that they have been very supportive. I would like to say that. But this support should be continuously, not for one, two years, that we don't have this still in our culture. But um, maybe it's because life is far too difficult in that part. I don't know what is it. There's some problems that yeah. I never understand. But to be positive, sooner or later, we're going to be normal like other places around the world. That <laughs> I mean, the artists should not worry about so many things. I mean, they're much they need some supports in every sense, even the debates, as you said, to sharing ideas, things like that, in a good principle. I mean, the way that I said, because I hope soon we're going to have a clean, nice, <laughs> disciplined places that it's truly dedicated for, for artistic activities and nothing behind it. But okay. uh, On that very high positive note, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Oh, thank you. I <laughs> Do we have a few minutes to yeah, see if anyone in the audience, yeah? Yeah? Audience. yeah? Any, any, Can yes, please. I'm keeping, I'm, I'm going to keep an eye on. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Here, here. So much. My question is: Am I right to say that in your work, you don't use Arabic um, letters? Uh, no. But, um, actually, the of the alphabets are the same. Writings of which we use the same alphabet. No, but the the, the Arabic like there's. A, a uh, a no, and also like tain. No, we do Arabic. Arabic is short of a few letters that Persian has. Yeah. But um, it's the same letters. And it all comes out of the Quran being written in Arabic script. And therefore, that's the script of all those places in the world where they, they adopted Islam. Right. No, but am I so that saying, um, like, say, is, not, is an Arabic letter? But and I don't see like or okay. If I may, because I'm not right. I'm acting. I'm I'm doing. Uh, none of these are readable. Don't yeah. try to read it. This is what we were saying. <laughs> I transform. Yeah. That's your mistake. I I like this because this is Iranian. Go backward, forward to the work, and they think it's something wrong with me. I cannot read. <laughs> okay, you 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 found something that this alphabet exists or not. I haven't written anything, so it's not readable. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, can, can you please? Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to reflect on something that Susan was, was, was saying. Um, I've been following your work for a number of years, and looking back at your body of work before, with the lines and everything, two days ago I came be here not expecting to see to see what I felt without any knowledge of the time that you did the work, without any knowledge of the background and the circumstances. Sorry, I've, I've got a little cold, so I can't really uh, speak very well today. Um, but I can say that I knew that this work has come out of its time. Um, and um, I was very impressed by um, how your work has evolved, and by the output during a, a particular historical time. Um, well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is my second award. 
I, I, thank you. It means a lot. I mean, this emotion means a world to me. Thank you. I saw you the other day, you came. This is the second. Thank you so much. I'm going to give you a hug later. <laughs> he does, I mean, deserves a hug. <laughs> no, yes, absolutely. That's, that's really important to sort of... Um, Thank I you. I can cry with you. <laughs> yeah, the, the, um, the conveyance of the days that you have been doing this. So tears are sometimes fabulous because mm. tears can express the unspoken words again. Yeah. They're like my, yeah. like my scribbles. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and in fact, the emotionality that you see in the work is really the critical point about it, the, the sort of thickness of an intensity of that emotionality. And, and I think that comes out. You need not tell us about it, no, as I mean, you can tell. When I see his know. reaction, you know, that's yeah. why I say, I did it. Yeah. I did it. Believe yeah. me. Yeah. It, um, we have a question here, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it's halfway between a question and a comment, but um, again, Going back to what you said right at the beginning about language and sign, um, for me the paintings are so intensely strong in the same way that, say, some of the work of Henri Michaud is, where he is, but it's precisely for, for me because it isn't precise. You know, you cannot read it, therefore you can read many different things into it either visually or in terms of sign and, and poetry. But also when I look at them and I, I'm thinking, I hope you don't mind me saying so, uh, for instance, of Anthony Tapies. And he ruptured everything, but also he went back to medieval Catalan tradition. So when you're talking about tradition, I, in a way it doesn't matter to me, tradition or not tradition, because it's what you're bringing into the work that you've given to us here. And that sort of imprecision is so so vital. Um, I don't know if I make sense. But no, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. And even thank uh, Antonio Tapias that you mentioned. He has always been my inspiration. I l from the beginning of my career, he has been a good teacher for me. Believe I, I used to see his works through book. During that time, we couldn't find a book. It was the years after war, no bookshops, no foreign books. It didn't exist. I had to beg. If rarely anybody was traveling outside to bring me a book, and, and I was asking, how long does it take your trip? For example, 40 days. I was counting every 40 days to have that book. And the first books I asked was Tapia. So right now, the bo those books are something special for me. I can find it anywhere like right now. But I know how patient I have been to receiving them. And the only treasure I had was two, three books. That's all. So I have learned a lot from Tapia. But as you said, silent poem. That's very nice as well. Eckhart Tolle has something else. He has a book that the title is uh, Silent Speaks. That's nice as well. So um, this is the thing that I know you're a poet. I'm not a poet. I, can, I don't know even one poem by heart, but we understand each other. Again, this is the magic of art. I, for me, the, pa the paintings are so many things, but they are also drawn poems, if I can say that. They're That's genuine, nice. You know? That's why I cannot, I mean, I'm not a good speaker, I'm not a good writer. That's why I use my brush. 
you use the words absolutely wonderful. That's I'm, I'm ashamed whenever I have to talk about my work because uh, I cannot find the correct words. I cannot express it correctly. And uh, at the moment I'm working, I'm not thinking about anything. Even when I have to say why spray, I mean, the reason I don't, one of the reasons when I don't let anybody come to my studio is I have everything around me and it's a mess. But if somebody touches this eraser from here to here, then it's a disaster. Because when I'm working, I know where I'm not looking there. I know if my hand put it there, it comes, the spray is there, the, I don't know, brush is there. I'm not even looking, I'm, I'm, I'm transformed into another world. That's my meditation time or um, I'm high, I don't know what is it. Something happens that I'm not here and then when I put that flat line, then I'm back on earth. Hi Gunez, um, you're inspirational to me. Oh, um, thank you, and I'm happy you, you um, came. So my question is, as um, somebody who's who's used art as my rebellion against traditional upbringing um, can you speak to that moment of the courage it takes to sort of step away because sometimes I'm feeling like I have to kind of stand in that of having art as a way to um, as my rebellion so if you could speak to that. Sure. Uh, I studied traditional calligraphy and I owe this to my father. He took me uh, and my sister and a group of friends to make it more interesting for us one summer vacation to, to uh, Iranian Calligraphy Association. I think I was 13 years old, something like that. No computers at that time, at least in Iran. And he said, having a nice handwriting, it's a prestige. When you grow up, you want to apply for a job. The applications that you're going to fill out, beautiful handwriting <laughs> would help. So he took us only for two months to, to practice, and our handwriting becomes nice. It opened a new door for me. If he hadn't taken me there, I would have never, ever discovered calligraphy. I felt in love with it. And uh, it's once a week. The master gives you one line of a poet. You have to practice the whole week. Take your homeworks there. None of the friends and my sister had any homeworks when we were going the next time. I had a bunch of them and they were making fun of me. Oh, you want to get spoiled, you want to get bravos. And, and they couldn't believe, no, I felt in love with calligraphy. So the only one who continued it was me. Uh, on I mean, I just followed my heart. Yeah, that day we didn't have any art scene in Iran. Uh, not a thing that later, I mean, I'm talking about 15 years, 20 years later than that, that uh, calligraphy paintings became very fashionable in the world, you know. So I did that when I was 13 years old, and I continued to learn it. Then um, I got the award of the best female calligrapher in one type of writing. And um, this association, they knew that I'm studying graphic design at university. Then I'm doing painting in my free times, and then it's calligraphy. And calligraphy is like being a ballerine. You have to practice every day, no weekends, no holidays, nothing. I used to, I remember when I was traveling to other cities, even, uh, I don't know, Tabriz, who, whatever, in two hours away from Tehran, I had to take my pen, paper, ink, to practice. So they told me, you can't do, at the same time, three things. 
and you have talent, dedicate your time to traditional calligraphy and we don't have a woman in history. And that's true because in old times, I mean, women had to take care of home, kids, no time. It's a lifetime dedication to become a calligrapher. It's very, very hard, extremely hard. The difference, if I want to compare with painting, is uh, everyone can learn painting, then it's the point of innovation and creativity. Calligraphy, it's difficult even to learn, but then it comes, is there much creativity in it, or then it becomes more, more like a craft. I come from a normal family. None of my parents are into art, so I didn't have this dialogue to, to take get an ad, uh, advice that what should I do? Uh, still young, knowing not having connection with any artist, nothing. And it was a very, very difficult time in my life to what what I want to do. I love calligraphy. I mean. I didn't care to practice 10 hours a day. I was practicing that much that when I opened my, I mean, for hours and hours that I was writing, you know, I couldn't open my my hand. It was stick, what is it? Uh, it, it needed time. To Stiffened. Yeah. Stiffened. Yeah. And uh, so one day I went there and I told, I've, I've made my decision and all the masters were there, and I said, I chose painting. <laughs> and, and they said, you did a wrong decision, and we are sure one day you're going to be back, and sorry for that, but that would be too late. Since then, I stopped doing traditional calligraphy. I never, ever went to that association anymore. And it hasn't been one second that I was sorry, but that was a big step for me to say, that was, that's why I say I never did that because it was very, f I mean, l years later, it became very, um, what is it, loved by Middle East, this kind of work, but I followed just my heart and and I said, okay, I have learned it for a few years. What I want to do with it? I mean, all this effort gone, just like at this? I said, I'm going to mix it with the things that I knew. So that was with the first paint uh, exhibition that I said in the beginning. It was readable. Then, then I said, no, I don't want this. So I started to transform into pure form. So can I, the historian, say what I think about what you have done? May I? Please. Thank you. I, your version is yes. your version and perfect. Now, <laughs> now my version of it is that, did any of those sisters and cousins continue to do art? Oh, no way, they were laughing. I always. rest my case. So <laughs> the whole point is that what we call craft or tradition or the old, uncreative, not creative, all of those things that you did, which you dismiss because you chose to do something innovative like painting, break away, all of those are the basis of the artist that you are. <laughs> it awakened in a way. If I were to write about you, I would say those are the things that awakened the artist in you, yeah. that it was crucially important to do those practices every day. It's a muscle that you're developing. It's like a, you know, developing your muscles, actually. Exactly. And I think it's really, that's what I meant. There is nothing dismissive about tradition, about classical, about craft, but rather the fact that they collectively uh, give you the ammunition, they feed you, basically. No and doubt. that's the, the sort of uh, material that makes you who you are as an artist. That's my, if I were to write about Golnaz, that's how I would write it. I think that's a wonderful conclusion <laughs> to today's uh, event. And I thank you both so much for being here. It's a pleasure.